thank you and thank you nick for the introduction um and also for your um uh for your tribute to to malcolm who was um uh, a key collaborator for us and actually a, a a strong source of inspiration for for many of us so i'm going to talk uh not about the um the whole program um which nick has already covered I'm going to deal specifically with um, some questions on the epidemiology of malaria. And uh, it's important always to give credit where it is um, due. So the work I'm presenting is not really my own work. It's work uh, that's been led by the three names you can see there, Abdi Salam Noor, um, Bob Snow and Alice Kamal. Uh, Alice Kamal being a, um, a PhD student, well, recently um, passed her PhD and is now working as a postdoc um, with us in the program. So there are going to be some key concepts uh, for the talk. So the first is this uh, acronym PFPR2 to 10. So that refers to uh, Plasmodium falciparum malaria prevalence in community surveys of children between the ages of 2 to 10. And uh, the importance of that measure is that that is considered to be a good way of capturing you know, how much um, transmission of malaria there is in a particular community, uh, based on the idea that people are losing parasites all the time. So if you've got a particular percentage of parasites in that population, that implies that there's a sustained exposure to infected mosquito bites at uh, a level sufficient to maintain that uh, that percentage. So that's just infection that we're talking about, and that's not uh, necessarily um, symptomatic. Then on the right, um, there are three uh, different disease states that I'm going to mention. So one is cerebral malaria, which um, uh, to all intents and purposes means a child in a coma um, in Africa. And uh, the coma is defined by the Blantyre coma score, the um, score that uh, Nick mentioned, Malcolm Molyneux having been co-inventor of. There's severe anemia, which is caused by the parasites uh, chewing up all the red cells and is defined as a haemoglobin less than five. And there's respiratory distress, which is caused by a high um, acidosis in um, leading to leading to rapid breathing. So I'm going to keep coming back to those uh, four concepts throughout the talk, but I'm going to start by um, just mentioning why are we studying all of this? I'll come back to it at the end, but the point is that there are some control measures for malaria. Uh, bed nets and residual spraying to kill mosquitoes are two key, um, two key ways of uh, protecting children from infected bites. Uh, Anti-malarial drugs can be given as treatment, but they can also be given to prevent malaria in the first place. And you're going to hear about vaccines from Adrian later on in the, in the day. So the question I'm going to deal with is how do we monitor the impact of those? How do we look at Africa as a whole? to see whether the control measures are um, effective in reducing malaria transmission. And then in the second part of the talk, I'm going to deal with the question uh, as to you know, how much good does that do? Um, I, and there are, there are reasons both for and against, which I'll return to. So this is the 115 uh, year data set. Uh, you can see across, um, across these 115 years, there have been many surveys, each of them is indicated with a green dot. So as you might expect, there are many more surveys done in the modern era than there were done previously. And so that means that one has to do uh, some geospatial uh, modelling to bridge the gaps between all of these surveys. Um, it's, it, it's complex. I mean, let me capture the idea for now as just saying it's it's sort of pretty much smoothing between two points. You know, if you've got if you've got two points either side of the district, which both show a very high malaria prevalence, then it's a safe bet that in the middle of the district there's um, high malaria prevalence as well. So um, you could, as you might imagine, that is a more speculative um, 
proposition between 1900 and 1944, when you've got relatively few surveys, compared with 2010 to 2015. Nevertheless, if you do all of that, you do get a pretty consistent impression of the um, extent of malaria transmission in Africa. So on the left, there's the map as we would reconstruct it for 1900. Uh, and on the right, the map for 2020. So uh, you can see that the um, central um, Western Eastern Africa has remained malarious uh, throughout those 120 now years with the five year projection. If you look at uh, North Africa, you can see that a lot of North Africa has succeeded in eliminating malaria. Uh, some of those countries are certified by the WHO as having eliminated, some are not certified, but nevertheless, uh, to all practical intents, they, they have eliminated malaria. And then you can see uh, in southern Africa, the sort of margin has uh, retreated so that and there's almost no malaria left in, in South Africa and uh, Namibia, um, Zimbabwe also looking pretty good, although uh, you know Mozambique still still with quite a lot of malaria. So that's uh, sort of qualitative, you know, is there malaria there or not? Uh, we're also interested, though, by how much malaria there is. So this uh, GIF is showing you uh, the animation of how things have changed over time. And you can see that there are some areas. So if you cast your eye uh, around the Horn of Africa, uh, you know, Ethiopia, Somalia and the northern part of, of Kenya, um, you can see that malaria transmission uh, towards the end of the 1900s and in particularly into the um, year 2000 and beyond, there is now relatively um, little malaria in those areas. But if you look at Central Africa and at uh, west, the west of Africa, you can see there's a very dense area of malaria transmission where there's, you know, there's some up and down, there's some reduction in recent times but there remains a lot of malaria um, in those areas and really insufficient progress. So uh, one key question is what is causing the, um, the trends? Uh, so this graph at the top is uh, showing you uh, PFPR, again, the prevalence of malaria in the community um, on the y-axis. On the x-axis, you can see the year. So starting in 1900, uh, finishing off in 2015. So the red bars are telling us how many surveys um, went into measuring malaria. So it gives you some idea of how much uncertainty there is. But the average PFPR for all of Africa is shown by the thick green line with the confidence intervals in light green around it. So uh, you can see that there have been some declines. Uh, there's a decline that occurs in the sort of run up to 1950. Um, and then there's another decline that occurs after the year 2000, which is much more uh, dramatic. So the 1945 to 49 decline is probably largely driven by DDT and uh, a WHO effort to control malaria. Um, that effort to control malaria was abandoned, and you can see that um, that malaria then increased uh, after that. The reduction in malaria after 2000 is, it, is probably related to at least three factors. So one is that the bed net, or ITN as I'm putting it here in the point, but I re refers to bed nets, have uh, really increased in use across uh, Africa. Um, so in, you know, the pre-2000, bed net ownership in Kenya was generally down at sort of five, ten percent. Whereas today, bed net ownership in malaria, in malaria endemic areas is around uh, 70 percent. So it's a huge difference. And um, we, we believe that has had a substantial impact. Uh, anti-malarials have become more, well, more effective anti-malarials have become available since 2000, and we think that that has also had a fed, an effect. 
I suspect that climate has had an effect also, but it's not a straightforward effect. So if you look at the four graphs that I've got on the bottom now, so again, PFPR is on the y-axis uh, for all of them. There are four different potential explanatory variables. So the, uh, the minimum mean temperature across, um, across Africa, um, the mean rain as measured in the Sahel band, and then uh, socioeconomic factors. So the percentage of the population that is um, uh, in urban settlements versus rural, and the mean GDP across Africa. So you can see that there are trends in all of those things. I mean, the world, as we all know, has got warmer uh, between 1900 and 2010. Um, it has got, um, well, actually it's complicated to work out whether it's got drier or not, uh, just looking at the mean Sahel rain because there are opposing effects of climate change. There have probably been trends in two different directions. Uh, it's become more urban and there's been an increase in GDP. So while all of those things are trends that broadly speaking might go along with a reduction in malaria, you can see that if you look at the year to year uh, variations, none of those things tell a consistent story. You know, to tell a consistent story, what you would want to see would be uh, 1900 in the top left of the graph, 2010 in the bottom right of the graph, and a straight line joining them in a sort of linear progression between those two points. And you can see that that isn't the case. So it remains um, complex to predict what, what's going to happen um, with with malaria. Um, and I don't think we are able to model the future based on based on that. But we can at least monitor the, uh, the past and the present. So um, in case people are wondering about how the modeling is supported by observations on the ground. These are longitudinal data uh, from the Kenyan coast. So this is an area where we've got a lot of data. We've done lots of uh, malaria parasite surveys during the um, period between 1974 and 2014. And you can see that uh, with the one sentinel location in Africa, you can see that there definitely are trends. It's not just sort of random noise that we were looking at previously uh, with the with the African map, and that you can uh, relate some of the events that I was describing to the trends that we were seeing. So I'm going to leave talking about uh, parasite prevalence now in the community. And I'm going to talk about uh, the um, severe malaria um, phenotypes um, that I described earlier. And so I want to tell you about two um, observations that had led people to be concerned about the outcomes of malaria control in Africa. So uh, this sort of graphic is showing you what happens to the epidemiology of severe malaria as you go from a PFPR which is very high on the left of the graph to one which is very low on the um, right of the of the graphic. So uh, there's the uh, picture for severe malaria anemia towards the higher end and cerebral malaria towards the right. And that's because it's been a long um, established observation that as malaria transmission goes up, you see more severe anemia and less cerebral malaria. And that is uh, a concern because cerebral malaria has a much higher mortality rate than severe anemia. Uh, if children are admitted with severe anemia to a hospital with blood available, uh, the mortality is almost 0%. Whereas with cerebral malaria, the uh, mortalities that we see are, you know, well, depending on the hospital range between 10 to 30%. Along the bottom, I'm showing you histograms, which are the distributions of the ages of children admitted to hospital. So on the far left, you can see a histogram with a very big uh, peak down at the zero to one age group. And as you move right, you can see that that distribution flattens. 
And uh, that, again, is a long established observation that with more malaria, um, the presentations are in uh, more malaria transmission, I should say, the presentations tend to be in younger children. And as malaria goes down, you see older uh, children presenting with malaria. And that makes sense because uh, with malaria exposure, children become immune to malaria. And so as they become um, older, they get less malaria. That effect is less marked at high transmission intensity. So both of those effects made people worry that um, if you improved malaria control in Africa, you might actually have a harmful effect. And so this is a, an old graph. This is a graph from 1997. The initials on the graph are referring to different places in Africa. There is again the uh, parasite um, uh, prevalence in the community along the x-axis of the graph. I mean, here is actually zero to nine years old. This was uh, an earlier era when that was the, um, the standard way of doing things, but it's, it would be very, very similar to the two to 10 year old um, estimate. And on the y-axis, you are seeing the um, disease rate among children. So what you would expect to see on this graph would be a straight line from the bottom left corner where you would see sort of zero parasites in uh, the community and zero parasites in hospital to uh, a straight line to the top right where you would see the maximum number of children being admitted with malaria and the maximum transmission in the community but you're not seeing that so I mean B is uh, in the bottom left hand corner uh, KT and then H do tell that story that as parasite transmission in the community goes up so uh, the disease rate goes up as well. But after that point, you don't see that. In fact, if anything, the disease rate starts to go down again. And so that led people to conclude that in a community with uh, more transmission, the mortality that you um, might have seen with malaria is offset by the uh, acquisition of immunity in childhood. And worse than that, that actually reducing malaria might even increase the mortality due to malaria. And this caused a very significant controversy in the malaria field uh, with quite, um, you know, I mean, the sorts scientists took very polarized positions in the same way as you're sort of seeing around COVID at the moment. Uh, and this was, this was a decision that was of extreme public health urgency. So here is an updating in 2021 of that um, of that relationship. So you can see that you know the uh, the ability to draw graphs um, in the community is clearly sort of improved in terms of the uh, the mathematics of it and the presentation of it. But it's basically the same thing. What you're seeing on the bottom is the parasite prevalence rate in the community, and what you're seeing on the left are the admissions per thousand children per year. And you can see that in this graph, you are seeing what I was saying we would hope to see, i.e. that as uh, parasite prevalence goes up, the admissions uh, per child per year go up as well. So it raises the question, were we just wrong in 1997? Um, did we you know, choose the locations badly or was it the fact that it, it was a smaller data set, uh, perhaps less precisely measured? Um, I think there's another factor, though, as well, which has changed. And that is that back in 1997, the access to treatment was very poor. Uh, children would frequently be left in the community for um, many days, if not a week or more, with a fever, without access to anti-malarials. Whereas in 2021, uh, the average child in Africa um, lives uh, five kilometres or less distance from a dispensary. And the likelihood of that dispensary being open and able to give them an anti-malarial is much higher. And their access to hospital care is better. And so my own view is that that is what's changed the relationship, that back in 1997, the main survival advantage a child infected with malaria had was their immunity. Whereas in 2021, 
uh, it's the health system that uh, is there for them and it is less likely that immunity is going to be the ter determining factor and hence we can now be confident that uh, reducing malaria is is unequivocally a good thing and reduces the, uh, the, the risk of death severe disease um, now my slide seems to have frozen I oh, got it so uh, I'm now breaking that relationship down by severe malaria respiratory distress distress and cerebral malaria uh, and you can see that um, what I said is true for severe anemia and for respiratory distress for cerebral malaria it's hard to know what is true uh, because actually it's just a very rare um, outcome. It was an extremely noticeable outcome for us in the early days because it's it's such a dramatic thing and there was probably quite a lot of misdiagnosis of severe anemia as well in the in the old days but when you measure it carefully although cerebral malaria is very dramatic and those children need um, need treatment it's actually not the thing that drives the epidemiology of malaria and so the uh, the potential increase in cerebral malaria's transmission goes down uh, turns out not to be such a problem for us. Now what about the age distribution thing? Well here that is again in, with data uh, uh, compiled in 2021 and you're seeing those graphs again um, as, as transmission, I'm sorry, perhaps rather confusingly, I put it the other way around. So on the left this time we've got um, PFPR, the parasite prevalence being less than 5%, and then moving over to on the right being higher than 30%. So you can see that it is true that as you get um, more malaria transmission, it's increasingly younger children that you're seeing and the older children are relatively protected. But what you can see, I think, from these graphs is that there's so much more malaria in uh, at over 30 percent compared with you know below 10 percent say that actually the uh, the relative protection of older children doesn't even come close to undoing the impact of the overall increase in how much malaria there is so I'm going to come back now to uh, some longitudinal data. That was that was data across East Africa that I was showing you previously. I'm going to come back to longitudinal data in a single site, uh, and that being Kalifi County Hospital. So the graph on the left is showing you the um, median age of children admitted to hospital dying. And they're separated in the red line with those who die with a positive malaria slide and those in the blue line with those who have a negative line. And you can see that, uh, again, on a local level, we are seeing that as uh, malaria transmission goes down in Khalifi, the average age of children with malaria, that's the graph on the right, and the average age of children dying with malaria, that's the graph on the left, does increase. So the older children are relatively um, less well protected. However, in Khalifi, we've also got the advantage of being able to match the, um, the children who are admitted to a population. And that means that we can uh, get quite an accurate estimate of the number of children um, uh, compared with the population denominator who are admitted to hospital. So the graph to focus on here, I think, is the top left one, mortality, and the blue line for mortality. And you can see that uh, although, uh, as I showed you in the previous graph, the average age of children dying has gone up. There are many fewer children dying of malaria in Khalifi as time goes by. Uh, and that is true in the other graphs. You can see that that is true of other uh, forms of severe malaria. Um, and so I think we can be again reassured that the reduction in malaria has been a good thing. It has had uh, positive impacts on public health. So that brings me on to my uh, conclusion slide that um, I think that uh, we can see that malaria transmission in Africa as measured through parasite surveys shows some reductions over 115 years. And we can see that in uh, certainly in East Africa, and we um, expect it to generalize to Africa as a whole 
we can see that uh, more malaria transmission leads to more severe malaria. And so even though immunity is acquired with more malaria, uh, nevertheless, that isn't enough to undo the harmful effects of, immuni of uh, the harmful effects of malaria. And so I'd leave you with the hopeful conclusion that uh, malaria control is possible and it reduces deaths um, and is uh, is no doubt a good thing.